Um, so thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. I know this is kind of a, a little more formal than what we usually do for our OST meetings. And don't get used to this. We're going to be in the basement somewhere next month anyway. So <laughs> it's good. We're totally fine. So, um, but today, you know, uh, what I wanted to do about to, uh, for today, and um, as some of you know, the, out of the actual appreciation week happened, I think, April 22nd to 26th, but what I wanted to do for today is um, have some real acknowledged out of school time appreciation week, not just after school professionals week, because in my mind, out of school time means everyone who serves youth out of the school day, and that includes everyone in this room. And uh, part of what today is about is just showing a little bit of appreciation, not only for the work that you do, but for the impact that you have on the kids in the city of Somerville. Because um, I think in a lot of cases, it goes unrecognized, and a lot of the stories and the trials and tribulations and blood, sweat, and tears don't make it um, on the, to the paper or to the news, and I think that's unfortunate, and I'd like to do everything I can to change that, uh, to make sure that people are aware of all the great work that's going on. Part of what we're doing, these are two different uh, programs or two very different intents. The February vacation, as you all recall, was about getting providers to work together to provide additional slots and provide additional scholarship slots and access in a way that would not have been otherwise possible if the entities tried to do this on their own. A April vacation intention was very, very small, but that was intentional, and that's because the agency, Groundwork Somerville, wanted to start building its operational capacity because Groundwork Somerville, like Parkour, Somerville Media Center, is sort of a specialty program that's used serving, but wouldn't be necessarily considered a child care agency. So with the April Vacation Program, they operated for the full week and then served 10 kids. And, uh, you know, I mean, you can see some of the photos. I know it's a little bit dark up here. I apologize for that. But uh, the program was phenomenal. I mean, even at the end, the, uh, the, uh, what the kids learned and what the kids got out of it and the impact that was created on those 10 kids was really, really great. And I know Kat hopefully will speak to that later. Um, next slide, please. So here's a list of youth serving agencies uh, that I could collect that are in, based in Somerville. Now, if I, let me just preface this. If you don't see your name up here, okay, I'm very, very sorry. It was not intentional. Uh, part of why I'm showing this is because there's a ton of agencies that are actually serving kids throughout Somerville. All sorts of ways, all sorts of times, all sorts of programs, um, and, and the vast majority of them are doing really, really great work. Um, can we go ahead? Next slide. But what's interesting, though, out of all those agencies that you saw on the last slide, if you define a program in this sense as after school, and what do we, what do we mean by after school? If I start defining that uh, in terms of servicing child care needs, uh, if, it, if it was a school year program that occurs between the end of school until at least 5 p.m., operates a minimum of four days a week, similar to citizen schools, and operates during early release and or vacation weeks, you have uh, the following. Seven entries in the city of Somerville. So out of all those agencies and entities, you have seven, or excuse me, yeah, seven, uh, the, uh, that actually have consistent operational schedules that could be considered childcare, that serve working families so that they can go to work and then pick up their kids at a time where they can get off work and continue their careers. And so some of the numbers that were up here, you know, if you notice, uh, these are all self-reported by the agencies, by the way. And the number of kids that are, look at these totals down here, the number of kids are being served is about 1,300. There's about, out of those 1,300, about 563 of those kids are uh, economically disadvantaged or qualify for free and reduced lunch. If you look at the uh, over left column here, the total number of students from pre-K to grade eight in summer public schools is about 3,263 students. Obviously that number fluctuates throughout the year, um, plus or minus 50 to 75. Uh, total students being served right now, 1,300, but the total number of free and reduced economically disadvantaged in SPS from pre-K to 8 is 1,261 kids, of course, compared to the number being served, 563. So that's a huge gap. It's massive. There's 1,000 kids who can be considered economically disadvantaged or would qualify for free and reduced lunch who are not getting what would be deemed as traditional after-school child care. And it's not to say that all those kids necessarily want it or even need it. However, uh, I think what's interesting is that for the Somerville Public Schools and what Mary and Jeff have been working on, uh, especially with Citizen Schools, Citizen Schools has opened a new site every year for the past two years and have filled both sites and are planning a third opening this upcoming school year. And I have no doubts that it will fill like that. Um, and so when you're looking at you know, some of these agencies, because technically some of these agencies don't have waiting lists, but the waiting list doesn't really really calculate the, the demand uh, or the, the need uh, for what's happening uh, for after school in Somerville. 
So a lot of, you know, I wanted to run through my slides pretty quickly because it's, uh, you know, I don't want to be up here talking the whole time. And I want the providers to sort of speak to these two questions. Ultimately is, what do providers envision for the future of after school in Somerville? And uh, what are some of the issues providers face? Um, I am Vanessa Bishop. I am the Regional Managing Director for Citizen Schools. Um, here with Angela Pisa, who is our Winter Hill Campus Director. And um, we have really thoroughly enjoyed our, our partnership with Somerville. Um, it, we've had great partners both at the district and the school levels in serving the kids that we seek out to accept. And just a little bit about citizen schools for those who may not be too familiar. Uh, we work only with middle school students, fifth grade through eighth grade. And um, our program seeks to expose students to different career and educational pathways. And we do that using our core apprenticeship model that brings volunteers in from the community and corporate partners to work with students. They commit to 90, minute, uh, 90 minutes a week for 10 weeks in what we call apprenticeships where they do project-based learning with these students that uh, models the different types of career and educational pathways that they can do. So hopefully by making it a little bit more real and relevant to them, that, that also encourages them during the day but also adds an excitement to the school day. You know? And our hopes um, long term are just reshifting the way people think about education. Um, and so we've done that work with, we started first with East Somerville, moved on to uh, Winter Hill as our second school, and next, next year we'll be moving on to Argentiana. And to the, the question about um, what do we envision, we currently um, are serving about 100 students at East Somerville and then about 80 students at Winter Hill. Um, initially, the target number of students at Winter Hill this year was 40, and so that's what we kind of hired and staffed for. However, um, with our compassionate hearts and um, Angela and her team's inability to say no, we've continued to enroll <laughs> kids that wanted to, to go there, and so um, it increases our numbers a little bit, and so we're, not, we're doing a great job with them, and the students are amazing. Um, but would have liked to be able to hire on additional staff to make sure that we keep our numbers at a, at a, a ratio that, that makes sense for our model. Some of the other challenges that we are facing is also like making sure that we have enough information about students so that we can provide them the services that they need and adapt similarly to what's done during the school day. And so even though we are, we, uh, our staff is not certified educators, information about like what are some of these accommodations that may be helpful to keep these students engaged would be helpful and um, really respect the work the district has done around keeping um, pri the privacy of students and families safe and so um, part of the challenge is also working to share some of that data that will inform our staff but will not feel overly intrusive for students and families um, so I would say those are probably our biggest challenges that we are, are facing now. Um, Blake from Parkour Generations, uh, I run our Boston branch as well as our national uh, branch and we're a Somerville based company. We've been here since 2012. Um, I think a lot of our roots are very much ingrained thanks to the rec and community schools. Um, and I think we've, we've grown a lot because of the connections that we've forged with um, other programs in Somerville. Um, and I think that's just a testament to s partly to, to how much the city has started to connect and we're seeing those, those fibers um, between organizations. Um, and obviously having Jose here as, in the workshop that we did in February was, was a first step. Um, I think our vision is something even more unified. Um, I know I hate to be the one to, to bring it up all the time, especially being from Somerville, but we do a lot of work in Cambridge. Um, and a lot of the, the connections and the infrastructure there to make it so that um, different providers can partner sh with each other, they can share resources, um, there's shared transportation, there's shared data. Uh, a lot of those things are pain points that we don't have yet here in Somerville, and I say yet because I think we're making a lot of progress. Um, but as a specialty provider, um, we're not offering childcare. Our coaches are some of the best coaches in the world for parkour. Um, we're not offering kind of full day child care. That's, that's not what we're good at. That's not what we specialize in. But we want to be able to offer access to high quality programming to kids 
from every background. And I think what we're seeing is there's very much a, a group that can afford um, kind of market rate prices. And uh, those of you that have been here in Somerville uh, probably realize that market rate is something that's changing. Um, but it means that a lot of kids are getting left behind, and especially those, uh, especially groups that are really need the benefit of physical access, uh, phys physical activity, and especially non-competitive physical activity that is built based on building confidence um, and awareness and kind of one's role in a community, and that's what we're trying to build. So I think for us, um, the February program was a, was a great start, and we've built a lot of really powerful uh, connections with a number of groups here in Somerville, and I think we're just looking for more of that. But the big pain points for us at this point are, are transport, so having access to after-school programming, even if a kid is not at that school or at that site or with that program, um, so some sort of shared transportation network. Uh, and I know the Y did a, an amazing job over the February break pilot to make sure that the kids were able to get from the armory down to the media center, and that was just something that they made happen magically, it seemed like, um, and we appreciate that. But that just does highlight a lot of the logistical challenges. Um, since we're not a child care kind of facility and we don't need the full data access, um, it would be really great if somebody could be tracking the impact of a lot of programming from a centralized location to be able to see what type of impact we're having on kids, what are the short-term and the long-term um, impacts of, of our programming and other people's programming, whether there's something, whether it's parts and crafts plus parkour creates this effect um, with certain groups or there's other kind of tangible out outcomes that we can get. Um, and then the last thing that I think for us is the, the timing component. Because there is a, a small window of time after school and when parents need pickup, there's a lot of time that can be uh, wasted in transit or kind of in filler time and what we want to do is try to partner with programs to try to fill that time and, and introduce high quality programming into that time um, so whether it's uh, for example a half day when programs are suddenly their days extended by two hours the idea of bringing in a specialist program um, or somebody else to come in and, and offer something unique something uh, special um, or if there's, there's a gap um, in your schedule, uh, finding a way to have a, a shared network of, of specialist providers that can come in and fill that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dina Dirksen. I'm a co-director of Parts and Crafts. We are a kid-directed uh, kid learning center. We're, we're, we're a makerspace. I, I think most people associate us with like making and STEM programming, but I think the focus of our programming is more on letting kids pick things that they're interested in doing and pursue them. Um, for us, I think we pride ourselves on being a, a creative safe space for kids that don't fit the mold, some of whom don't fit the mold just a little and some of whom don't fit the mold a lot, which includes in some cases kids with special needs who I think are underserved in after school or certain behavioral issues that just make the traditional after school experience kind of a problematic or an extension of the problems they have in school without the support that they get there. Um, when I think about the future, we're a nonprofit. We have a lease, two leases. That's what I think about a lot because th these leases exist in Somerville and that might not be something that we can support in the future. So I looked at those numbers and our percentage of kids that we're serving that um, are low income is lower than a lot of places and I think that has a lot to do with location, where we are. I think if we were over on this side of town, we'd have a lot more. Or if we could get, we have one van with eight seats, so if we could get those kids over there and we'd be happy to try and provide scholarship for them. We've been lucky to get some funding this year, but we physically have to get them from point A to point B. I've had people turn down scholarships because they couldn't get their kids from the place we're standing right now to the location I have to leave after this meeting. So my name is Heather McCormick. I uh, run youth programming at Somerville Media Center. Um, I have been, for the better part of eight years, privileged to be working in after school here in Somerville. Um, I started out at the Mystic Learning Center and worked there for many years, so the, the full day, all care, provider kind of model and then for the past three years I've been at Somerville Media Center teaching media education, um, running workshops, classes, maker spaces, um, teen job programs um, and internships and, um, and I am the youth media staff so <laughs> that's me um, and a few college interns every semester. So, um, so 
one thing that has always been able to like sustain me and, and make my job be able to run at an organization that like has like at the Mystic Learning Center, we did not have a lot of resources, we did not have a lot of money, and I saved my life um, by having partnerships. Like I have so many people in this room right now who we've collaborated on youth programming together. When I was doing that full day care, um, a 10 hour day is a very long day, right, in the summer or whatever. So we would have Groundwork Somerville come and we would do um, community gardening or we would have a theater program where we were working with the Beautiful Stuff Project to create recycled um, out costumes and working with um, like outdoor organizations like the Youth Opportunities Program to go on trips and stuff like that and taking advantage of all of those different partnerships. And now that I'm on the other side of that where I'm working at a um, agency that serves all, all folks, it's not a youth center, um, and I'm not doing childcare, but very similarly to, to Blake, what we're doing is very specialized, um, fun, exciting, new programming, teaching kids how to make films and stop motion animations and creating their own podcasts and all of this stuff. Um, but we can't reach every young person if we're not able to, to provide that same um, continuum of care where they're able to be, um, where working families can afford to send you know, their kids to us. Partnerships with other organizations on, now on the other side of things um, is going to be crucial for the future of um, after school and out of school time um, in Somerville. And I really look forward um, again to um, during the school year and beyond to doing more of the partnerships with like the YMCA we're working with the PHA YMCA and with Breakthrough Greater Boston and coming into their space and and programming bringing programming to them um, we love doing that we want to be a partner in that um, but having funding and transportation and support, um, I also want to echo like the measuring of impact. Like that's a really important piece, um, an ongoing evaluation to know what we're doing right and how we can improve the things that we're not doing as as well um, is really important to me. Hi, I'm Rosanna Parabello. I'm the current director of the Community Schools Program. Um, we run after-school programming in all of the elementary schools in Somerville. Um, we also do a summer program um, and we do vacation camp, vacation week programming. Um, so we, I think um, the program has changed a lot over the years. It started off as a daycare program and expanded into um, you know, more enrichment, academic fo pro um, focus programming. And currently we're going through more changes and looking at ways that we can make improvements um, and expand slots, like we're all saying, um, making sure that all children are served in the community. Um, and they're not being turned away because of financial needs. Um, that's an important piece that I think we've done a lot of work over the years, creating different ways to make sure it's affordable for all students of Somerville. Um, and so for the vision, um, I think that we all do this great job of providing different types of programming, and I would like to see um, the Somerville Hub expand it a little bit more so there's one point of entry so um, programs can give all their information to this one place or person, <laughs> entity, um, that can give um, parents options. And this is a way so that we're not replicating programming. I think that um, the information needs to be out there more and more marketing needs to be done so parents have this um, variety that they can choose what is appropriate for their needs and their children. Um, I think that's an important piece and I think this year I've really been trying to work with different community members to make sure that we're bringing in different programs and working together to not replicate things. Um, and issues that we're facing, I think because we're school-based, um, we have a particular issue maybe different from other people and that's space. Um, so we really have a hard time getting into classrooms. Um, we have lots of students and it's, sometimes it's difficult to get into classrooms and find space for what we need to get done. Um, so that's a piece that we would really love to try to figure out, um, which again is probably only isolated to our program, but um, I think we all um, have similar needs um, around space and trying to figure out where to do our programs. This is a, an interesting and unique position um, in Somerville uh, we're probably one of the only providers that's actually a national model. The YMCA, as probably most people know, uh, is actually an international 
uh, program. They actually started in England and came to the U.S. And I'm not here to give you a history lesson, but this, this YMCA started in 1867. So um, we have been around for about 150 years. Uh, some people say I came with the building, and that's not actually true. <laughs> but I've been here for over 40 years uh, working for the Y, and uh, it's been uh, quite a change over that period of time. We have large number of programs. We're specifically talking about child care and after school programs, but um, that's just a, a, a portion of what we do. There are gym and swim programs that happen on weekends, after school, during the day. Um, so the actual number of children that we provide services to is much larger than just the, the child care piece. When Jose was talking about this, um, this piece that we're going to be doing today, and he talked about the two questions um, to be answered. One of them was what you envision uh, the program to be. And you know, after being here for this long period of time, my hope was, um, I think when we first got here, uh, that we'd be able to expand the program and uh, actually create the program and then expand the program, and we did. Uh, and recently, we moved into the charter schools, which pretty much doubled the size of the program. So we're dealing with somewhere around 180 to 190 kids uh, on a daily basis. Um, and so when Jose asked me the question, I thought it would be funny uh, to say that what we envision at this point, what I envision, was that all across the city at this point, if at 2.30, quarter or three, as the children come into their classroom, wherever they may be, uh, our vision would be they would actually hear this. Now that was... It was a shot at being a little bit funny, but... Um, and I've been not accused of doing that too many times, unfortunately. Um, but at this moment, uh, what I'd say to you is, what we really would like to see is to be able to expand the program similar to what we did with the, with the charter schools at this point. Um, we would like to be able to provide more services. Uh, we have contracts with the state um, to do that. We accept vouchers, so um, we deal with our low-income population. Probably what we're missing at this point is a way to deal with the population that's just below, or rather just above that income level, and yet are struggling to be able to provide childcare. So they're not eligible uh, for some of the state-funded programs. So I think we'd really love to see that piece attacked if we can uh, and be able to provide those services there um, on a sliding scale. And that would mean more funding for the program, um, wherever that may come from, whether it's the city, the state, um, donations, whatever. In addition to that, um, we really would like to be able to do more collaboratives. I mean, we talked about working with the media programs um, and parkour with this thing in February that we just did, the, the vacation piece. But that's something that the Y has been doing for quite some time, actually before I got there, um, for sure, with many, many agencies in Somerville. So I'd like, love to see that continue. The, the impediments at this point are some of them would be around, some pe people have mentioned transportation. That's tough. For nonprofit agencies that aren't in the schools, the public schools, um, it's difficult to get all, we service every one of the schools in Somerville uh, as to the Peabody House. Um, and the difficulty in trying to get those kids to where they need to be uh, is certainly something that we could use the OST task force to take a look at and say, how do we share those resources? And we, we actually have a bus. Um, which we have been using for quite some time now, and that might be a resource uh, that can be utilized, and we did that with the transportation. But that's just one of the things, really being able to share those resources and still maintain our identity as a nonprofit is probably the most difficult piece to doing this that the Y would have. I want to say that we uh, currently serve, or we're licensed by the state, to serve 52 children between the ages of 5 and 12 years of age. 
Um, we have a social emotional learning curriculum. Our program director is India Drinker, who couldn't be here with us today. And we have a preschool um, program as well that we are licensed for 40 children. So most of our uh, after school children come from the preschool programming. Um, the other thing that we get lots of uh, children is because word of mouth. So we have generations and generations of family in Elizabeth Peabody House. Cousins, brothers, siblings, um, neighbors. So we often get whole generations of families in our, in our community, which is a, it's a great thing. Um, the other thing is that we partner with people like Parker, uh, Beautiful Stuff, MIT, um, Tufts, they come and they add programming to our after school curriculum. It is important that we do that because we want to make sure that our children get exposed to as many um, other opportunities that there is in the community. So we welcome to partner with anybody who has something to enrich the lives of our children. Um, in terms of our future or our ambition for the future, I want to echo the person from community in schools. Um, I think single point of entry is a good um, um, starting point. Um, I would like a little bit more collaboration in terms of information and referral, um, maybe from communities and schools. If you have a waiting list that it goes very long, and I have 11 slots from EEC that I have not been able to fill, well, how can we? fill that gap because I have, I serve eight, six to eight schools in this community. And so I go already because I have, uh, I have vans that I can go to these schools and I can transport these kids. But if I don't communicate that to you or to, to whoever, then I am not fulfilling my contract and I'm not serving the families in, in Somerville, ultimately. If I know that this student is closer to mystic learning than, <laughs> That would be my appropriate referral to Mystic Learning instead of trying to accommodate the family to Elizabeth Peabody House because it doesn't make sense for the family. Some of the things that I see as a working parent, because I'm a working parent, my husband is a working parent, is that parents juggle so many different schedules. And I see it every day with my families. I have families that have different people bringing them to after school because if it's not the neighbor, it's the grandmother. Every day, there's another adult involved in a child's life. So think about that. There's a transportation issue here. Let's start thinking about how our families can get together in this neighborhood because it's complicated. Um, they have to work. There's no way that they can make the cost of living if they, there's two people working in the household. Um, so, that to me, that's one of the issues that I see uh, for my families, that they are struggling. They're really struggling. When they cannot meet that EEC threshold of subsidized um, care, then they have to figure it out how they're going to manage this after school cost and transportation for their families. Um, so I think that's, uh, in a nutshell to me, it would be single point of entry, and also it will be transportation. If I think about and I project myself five years from now, 10 years from now, that's what I think our families and our community needs. Uh, I'm Kat Redkin, I'm the director of Groundwork Somerville. Um, also, as I was sitting here listening, I'm realizing that as a parent of two small kids, I think that almost every program that's spoken so far, we've been involved in. Um, and my older son has, um, he's sort of like a not fitting the mold kind of kid, and we've been able to find a place in almost every program for him to help him grow. So it's really incredible the work that everybody's doing in this room. Um, so, um, and so for Groundwork, for those of you who don't know, we do um, a lot of outdoor education. We manage the school gardens in all nine schools. In Somerville, we also have a quarter acre farm down behind Target on South Street. And if you haven't been there, it's this magical space. Please go visit. It's actually open to the public. A lot of people don't know that. Um, just don't wreck our plants. They don't let me touch them either. So, um, um, and then we also have a youth employment program where we basically employ um, youth between the ages of 14 and 18. 
We, as part of our garden programming, we do two lesson days with almost every Somerville public school student, um, but it's very sort of targeted and small, and a lot of the kids don't get to spend a lot of time in the garden. So, um, and we also are a provider through community schools, and we'll do several, like maybe three schools as part of their clubs every semester. Um, and we also did, as Jose mentioned, we had a small pilot during the April Vacation Program <coughs> with, um, in partnership with Leslie. We did a small little, um, not little, it was actually quite large, but I have this amazing staff who made it look really easy, even though I know it was a lot of work to get it together. Um, with middle schoolers, about 10 of them doing some pollinator education, and they made these pollinator habitats, and they were talking all about different kinds of bees. For us, you know, we would love to be able to provide more of that middle school programming um, and do more after school providing um, throughout the district. Um, and really, the issues for us, as most of the nonprofits, is capacity and like the staff at Groundwork is amazing, but we're all sort of operating at like 200% all the time. So. Between funding and staffing, like if we had more of that to build more programming, that would be wonderful. So anyone who had questions for any of the folks who came up and spoke just now? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I, I'm Stephanie Irish. I'm one of the at-large um, representatives on the city council, and I just wanted to say um, so much gratitude for you all for the work that you do. I have three kids in the school system, 7, 11, and 12, and what always strikes me, especially right around this time of year, when people are finalizing their summer plans is how you go through the whole school year and by and large kids kind of access the same resources so they go to Cambridge Health Alliance, they're eating the same lunch, they're playing in the same playgrounds, they are riding the same MBTA bus, they're going to the same schools and then you get to this juncture where some of my kids' best friends suddenly are on a completely different path and it's and it's really heartbreaking and I appreciate so much the work that you do to try, I know all of you hustle so hard to get kids in those slots to do the exciting things that kids are supposed to do in the summer and after school and I hope that we as a community can do whatever we can to get to deliver on the basics, space, transportation, money, food, helpers, whatever you need and, and, and I hope that we can do that more in this budget and more in the year after that more and more and more. I think when I look around the room, we maybe tripled the numbers from probably a year ago. We didn't have Jose, we didn't have some of these pilots. Um, we're filling in these gaps. Right? Some of promises charges around cradle to career. Not all of you spoke to all the other work you do for all those other ages. Um, I just want to recognize how hard we know you're all working and I could add to some of the comments Kat and Stephanie just made. You know, my family's benefited from many of the programs in this room, and they're some of the highlights for the year when kids are sharing with their grandparents or their cousins from somewhere else what they do. Uh, and stealing this from somewhere else, someone had told, you know, mentioned this to me, it's not always the math test they just took or the doctor's appointment they just went to, right? It's the very cool stuff they're doing in these creative spaces that stick with them in a really different way than some of their other, other life experiences. Um, so I just want to encourage you all. I think we've got amazing momentum going. We've got some really interesting ideas. We're just I think we had all the parts for quite a while now, and we're just telling the story in a way that is going to help. It's just going to help all the families that we're trying to serve. And, and I can hear you're not using the words equity and access and quality, but but that's at the heart of everything that's happening here, and that's that's really exciting to see. So thank you. Um, I would first like to begin and say thank you to everyone in this room. As was just mentioned, when these meetings first started, it was probably like six, seven of us. And now the collaborations are continuing to expand, and that's how we can continue to reach our community. It takes a village to raise and nurture and take care of all our youth in this city. As a working parent myself, I have a three-year-old, and it's very difficult to juggle programmings, juggle sitters, and juggle the schedules that are so much that's in front of us as working parents. Um, so I would just like to thank each and every one of you. Sorry that I'm tripping on this. Um, so the two questions that we face, what do providers envision for the future in, of after school in Somerville and what are some of the issues providers um, have? I'll start with some of the issues because it's a common thread, a common theme. Our main issue is space, space availability. As we know, the field house went offline um, April 1. 
The elderly is also going offline because other programs are being moved in there. And then the community schools need to use their spaces for their programming. And so we know Parks and Recreation, we just have an administrative building. We don't have a building that we can house programming in. So space is a major struggle. Space is gonna to continue to be a struggle for the foreseeable future until we have a field house back, until we have the Edgerly back, until we have some of these other places back. Um, the community schools take preference and I totally agree with that because there's their space and then if we can work our way in. Um, our vision, we were challenged maybe a few years back on being equitable and providing services across the board to all genders and all people and, and just being equitable across the board and so we took that challenge upon, upon ourselves as a department. We increased our programming substantially. We've also increased our participation with young women, young girls substantially. And that was our challenge as a department, to continue to reach our young ladies in the, in the high schools and in the middle schools and in the elementary schools. And that's something that we took on as a department as a challenge. And we've embraced that challenge and we've increased our participation numbers with the young girls. Um, we continue to increase our programming as well. And that is our goal, just to be equitable, continue to continue to provide excellent service and programming for everyone in Somerville. Um, and again, we thank you. Um, please keep in mind that our space is going to be an issue in the summertime as well. I just want to stress that. <laughs> I have brochures, and this is also, I guess, Jose, very quickly, 10 seconds, our last major struggle is, as, one, as everyone's saying, if we can just have one portal and expand on that one portal, because sometimes our, our programming flyers and brochures end up in a trash bin and not in, in, in a book bag or in someone's home. And so sometimes the word doesn't get out, although the word was put out. And so that's the struggle. Um, and just thank you for every, thank you everyone. Um, integrating all these things is going to be important. I like how we're all coming together to talk about where are those cross um, paths that we can do within that. Uh, single point of entry, but still being able to hold our own identity is an important piece of that. How do we continue to do that and build on that, that work? Space, yeah, space is a huge issue. Um, and transportation is a big issue, and it's something that I've taken notes on that we're going to try and help look at how, we, how can we possibly bring that together and solve some of those issues to look at these uh, challenges that we face. Because we're in the trenches, you're in the trenches every day, you know that stuff. For us to listen is an important piece of that so that we can start changing some of the systems and the policies that are in that. Um, I have a couple of staff here who are also working with that and helping to build some of those things. It's nice that we have uh, Council Member Hirsch here to listen as well so she can help bring that forward in our youth committees, even though that would be not a meeting for us at night. But that's okay, we can do these. Um, so thank you for doing this work. It's really, really important. And we appreciate the work that you're doing, how you're going about doing that, how you're willing to partner together and we'll, uh, with one another, and also to look for our funding sources and how else we can actually find additional supports. Um, it does take a community uh, to raise children um, because of the, all the factors that are there. You're an intricate, intricate part of that. The schools are an intricate part of that. We, well, Jeff was here. Um, oh, he's outside talking on the phone. Um, and the school district and how they're doing that, how we're blending all of that stuff together is really important. But finally, it is doing that evaluations to really understanding how do we measure the impact that we're actually making. I think it's always an important thing for us. Um, especially the administrators who kind of look at this and say, so what impact are you making? And we have to remember how do we mark that? So think about the times that you, uh, that you have worked with these kids and you walk home that time and you say, I remember, that was a great day. Mark those down so we can continue to celebrate that. And think about those things where we can bring back more funders um, to also share that story. And we're able to show where those successes are. It's a great thing. So yeah, thank you very, very much for all the work that you've done, um, what you will continue to do, and don't be shy about bringing them forward and asking us, hey, this is where we still need some help and how we can actually uh, build some of those cross partnerships on it. I do want to say one more thing, transportation is going to continue to be a problem, um, even more so now because you don't know what bridge to go over um, to get from one side to the other. I know I'm having a hard time trying to get around every once in a while. I had to respond to a fire the other day. And, yeah, you know, how do I get there? Uh, because, of course, whenever you block up streets because of fire trucks, then you've got to think of something different. Um, it's going to continue to be that way, but we're going to try and see what we can maybe think about. Jeff and I did some creative thinking last year. We'll see if we can do some additional creative thinking this year um, and building some new partnerships to try and do that as well. So we really do appreciate that. Okay, so our school time is before there's after school, clearly it's summer. Our 
you know, our initial focus is funding quality summer learning programs, but our intention is to fund out of school time through the community providers. That's what our mission is, and hopefully we can keep on expanding into that. Give a round of applause. Okay, great. <laughs>